with a new head coach. The soccer team has one more matchup before conference play. It's been a long summer away, but we're back here in Studio B. This is Cardinal Sports Live. Hello and welcome to the first Cardinal Sports Live show of the new semester. I am your host, Kaya Riggles. Joining me on the show tonight to talk about some Ball State sports are Emma Schaefer and Tim Rushi. How you guys been? I've been really good. I'm super excited to be back in the studio, even though it's chilly in here, ready to talk some sports. Oh yeah, definitely. As uh, ACDC says, I'm uh, back in black, or rather <laughs> blue, and uh, ready to talk some uh, Cardinal sports. Well, it's been a while since we've been here in Studio B, but the Ball State sports have been in full swing. So we'll get started here with the football squad. Now in his first game as head coach of the Cardinals, Coach Mike New led the team past Georgia State without too much of a contest. But last weekend, it was a bit of a different story. Ball State traveled down to Bloomington to face the Indiana Hoosiers, and the Cardinals had won the last three meetings of this in-state rivalry, but nothing really seemed to go their way this year. They fell behind 30 to nothing at one point in the third quarter before finally losing that game 30 to 20. So now looking back at that game, Tim, what happened to the Cardinals early on? Such a slow start that led to that loss. Oh, yeah. As you mentioned, Kyle, a, glar a glaring a hole in the box score was the zero points for Ball State in the first half there. You know, right out of the gate, they're behind 30-0. to zero. And even just from the kickoff, uh, they turned the ball over on their first possession. In fact, two of their first three possessions uh, resulted in turnovers. And right there, that's just a momentum killer. And then IU was able to convert on one of the turnovers, and they also scored on their second possession of the game. Uh, so IU was t up 10-0 already. And uh, it was just definitely, you know, similar to Georgia State game in that Ball State was in a hole early. But, like, uh, a Big Ten team is definitely harder to come back from behind than a Sun Belt team in Georgia State was. So as Tim mentioned, those turnovers are really going to kill your game. And um, I think that Coach New talked about how in the Georgia State game, the team was really adaptable, and they were able to – you know, mesh with the game, but I don't think they had that here against IU. And when you're on the third yard line and you don't score and it's 10 0, that's kind of your chance that the game is gone there. So I think the defense did great, but I think that second half is really where we lost the game. And um, I mean, our defense in the second half was fabulous, but we just weren't able to make that comeback. Yeah, definitely a tough loss for Ball State in that one, but it won't be the last time these two teams face here in the near future. There are already three more games scheduled between Ball State and IU in 2018, 2019, and 2020. Now, it's hard to predict how well the Cardinals will be playing that far down the road, but just looking at the future for Ball State with Coach New coming in, do you think he'll be able to turn this team around to find some consistent success? Oh, absolutely. I think already we can see a different mentality amongst the team, and I think they're more aggressive, they have more momentum coming off of the games, and that's only after two games. So I think in the future and in two years, Coach New is really going to transform this team, um, and I hope that 2018 to 2020, we can get our streak back against IU. But again, that is in two years. So we don't know what's going to happen with players, coaches, injuries. Um, it's kind of an unknown. Oh, yeah, definitely. And in 2018, uh, our quarterback right now, Riley Neal, will be a senior by then. And then also, you got to look at the younger guys, uh, you know, the freshmen and sophomores like Riley. They're going to be upper class in by then. Also, the recruits that Mike New is bringing in. Uh, one that stands out is Curtis Blackwell, a three star tackle uh, outside of Norwell High School. Uh, just a big body that can help run block for Darian Green and James Gilbert. And then, of course, pass protect for Riley Neal. And then also you got a quarterback in Tyler Vandenwall. Uh, he's out a quarterback out of California. Uh, California known for having these uh, fast-paced offense. That's what the West Coast offense is. Uh, similar, obviously, uh, fitting Mike New's schemes. And so when you see these players that Mike New uh, has committed uh, going into the seasons to come, I think definitely these matchups with IU will be a lot closer uh, than it indicated this past uh, Saturday. We'll keep an eye on the future. Looking forward to this weekend, the Cardinals will play their home opener against Eastern Kentucky. Ball State has won its last six home openers coming into this one and will be looking to make it number seven this weekend. So looking into this game, what do we have to look forward from the Cardinals to maybe get back on track so that they're ready for, the, for next week? Well, with Eastern Kentucky, yeah, similar to Georgia State, they run multiple quarterbacks. Uh, they had two underclassmen get big playing time in James James Smith Jr. and then a redshirt sophomore in Tyler Swafford. Then also you got to look at the redshirt senior Matty Mock. He's an SEC. He was an SEC All Freshman Team member. Uh, we played with Missouri before transferring over to Eastern Kentucky. 
Uh, if you start looking at his highlight tape, he's similar to Johnny Manziel in that, like, he kind of has, like, that edge to him, that swagger, uh, kind of likes to live on the edge a little bit, and, like, he likes to run people over, even though himself he only stands around six feet tall, so not the tallest. Um, but then uh, he's definitely, he creates trouble for opposing defenses, but then uh, with him, he didn't get as much playing time. He threw two interceptions right away uh, early on in the Purdue game, I believe it was, and so he hasn't really been playing much, and that's why I mentioned James Smith Jr. and Tyler Swafford, but I think definitely Coach New and uh, the rest of the coaching staff is planning for uh, Maddie Mock. Um, I really want to see this weekend our defense do great again. I think that's kind of been one of our key factors in the last Definitely. two games. So I really want to see them come out from the start um, like they played in the second half of IU and really get that momentum going. But I also want to see some game from our um, running backs. You know, we had Kevon Mabon with 84 yards off of five passes um, and Neil was throwing 231 yards against IU. And so I really want to see those connections again in this game. And we have some killer running backs. Um, you know, Malik Dunner is coming up and I think that this will just be a great opportunity for them to show their skills and really prove what they have. And that, combined with our defense, I think will come out for a win. Now, that game against Eastern Kentucky is scheduled to kick off at 3 p.m. this Saturday in Schumann Stadium. Now, it's time for our first break of the night. When we come back, we'll talk about another Ball State team with a first-year head coach. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Cardinal Sports Live. Ball State held a retirement ceremony a few weeks ago for former women's volleyball head coach Steve Shondell. Now, in his six years as head coach, he led the Cardinals to a 119 and 68 overall record. He also led the team to win the 2010 MAC regular season title and a share of the 2013 MAC West title. Now, looking back on Shondell's tenure here at Ball State, what do you guys see as his greatest accomplishment in his career? Definitely, I think it's got to be that MAC title that you alluded to in his first year here. Uh, unfortunately. Uh, years uh, since his 2010 uh, MAC title it hasn't really been the best for them, but I mean in 2011 they got an at-large bid in the NCAA tournament. Um, I mean Sean Dow definitely had a great career. I know we want to praise him as one of the best, but I mean I think we would have loved to seen him for another year and really improve uh, his conference record. Uh, he did have a two-to-one uh, win-loss ratio for his conference games, uh, but then definitely I think just the uh, con conference title he got, and also though his ability to coach. He, ar he had arguably two of the best uh, five middles of all time at Ball State in program history. Uh, and Kelsey Brandle, she was a part of that 2010 team and 2011 team. Uh, Haley Benson, she was a part of the 2012 through 2014 teams. Um, and they were ranked third and second respectively, or third and fourth, pardon me, uh, respectively in all time hitting percentage. So again, I think de definitely not just the win loss record, but also how he's able to develop his players. Um, Coach Shondell has done some amazing things for this program. And it's just hard to pinpoint one thing saying this is his most uh, or his best accomplishment, but I would have to agree with him and his 2010 MAC um, regular season title. Uh, I think that coming off of a losing season under coach uh, Dave Ross, 15-6, he just really transformed the program immediately when he stepped foot here, um, taking that head coach role. So I think that that was probably his best, but again, you can't really pinpoint one thing. And he's done some amazing things, not only in um, the Ball State um, program, but also for Burris and uh, everywhere else he's been a coach or an assistant coach. So I think it's just very commendable what he's done. Definitely a very well-respected coach, not only at Ball State, but in Muncie and wherever he's been. But forgetting at the, about the past now, we have to talk about this team right now. The Ball State women's volleyball team has really struggled here in the early part of this season. The Cardinals lost their first nine matches of the season before finally grabbing wins in their last two. First-year head coach Kelly Miller said at the beginning of the year that the season was going to be a bit of a process. Well, so far, that process hasn't turned out too well for the mm -hmm. Cardinals. What's been going on with this team? Yeah, so this has definitely been a process. I think that's a very um, appropriate word to use in this situation. And it's just too bad losing a coach, and transition is always hard. So um, I think what they've been struggling with is just getting that momentum. They've not found a strong you know, play or rhythm. Uh, their first few games that they lost, they just like weren't able to get points. They just weren't getting um, playing well together. There was no cohesion on the, on the court. Um, and so that led to their first nine losses. Um, they did have, in their second set of the first game, they went 34 and 32, which shows that they have fight in them. You know, they have that determination, and they're out there to play to win, but it just wasn't working for them. And when they would tie it up with any of those teams that they played in the first nine losses, they, the other team would just come back with a kill, and then we would just be out of it. So, but I think that finally what went right in those first um, two wins was the, um, the first game against Moorhead, they had a season high of 15 total blocks and 74 digs. So that is ridiculous. That's amazing. That's when our defense finally kicked in. Same thing in the next game. Um, key plays came from Avery DeVoe with eight total blocks. And then you have um, 
freshman libero, Kate Avila, who has just been a great player, you know, young, but she's been a leader out there on the court. And so it's really great to see what she's been doing. But I think these two wins are what we needed. After nine losses, you really got to get a win here or there if you're going to want to continue farther in the game. I think uh, definitely what Emma was alluding to in that it starts at the play at the net. Um, in Ball State, they have 40 blocking errors on the year, meaning they get tooled at the net. So the opposing hitters, they hit them off the block. And it definitely just closing up the block with the middle and outside and right side hitters, respectively. And also, too, just getting kills uh, on the offensive end. Uh, you look at Mackenzie Kitchell. Uh, she's the fifth year senior coming back. She's only hitting uh, buck, 30, buck 36 on the year. Uh, it's definitely way below the average that you'd like to have when your star uh, player's hitting. And it's just definitely. Uh, been noticeable in that they have 237 attack errors on the year and their opponents only 239. So, I mean, it's about even there. Uh, but again, like I alluded to earlier, it's about play at the net. And you think uh, Meg Starling should take that, that step to go even, uh, get even better than what she was last year as a sophomore, now as a junior. Uh, but, I mean, she's had her moments at times, but then just obviously hasn't always been the best. And you look at when she's rotating in with uh, Emily Holland, uh, they just haven't really been as formidable in the middle as I'm sure Kelly Miller would like them to. Definitely a lot of work to do here for the rest of the season so far for that team. Ball State will be back in action in Worthen Arena tomorrow to kick off the Active Ankle Challenge. They will, be, they will be playing two matches on Friday, one against UNCG in the other Valparaiso, and one on Saturday against Ohio State. Ball State went 3-0 in the Active Ankle Challenge last season. Now the Cardinals get all three of these games at home. They're coming off of two straight wins. Tim, how do you see the Cardinals coming out of this weekend? Well, I mean, I think when you look at the teams that are on the active ankle schedule this year, uh, they're a little bit better uh, compared to years past. Uh, UNC, Greensboro, uh, they are 4-5 and five on the year, but again, they play towards Ball State's uh, weaknesses and that they're hitting 206 on the year, and uh, they're only allowing six blocking errors on the year, so again, it has to do with the middle play. Uh, you look at Valpo, they're 6-5. and five. I actually look at Ball State to win this match. Uh, they're hitting a buck 84 on the year, and... They, uh, they have 21 blocking errors on the year, so again, I think that should play favorable for the Cardinals. And also, you look at Ohio State, they're 7-2. and two. I think if you look at any of these teams to sweep the Cardinals, it's definitely this one. Uh, they're hitting 245 on the year, only 14 blocking errors, so again, uh, they're getting kills and they're not really making errors on the defensive end. Yeah, I think te or Tim said it perfectly. Uh, Valpers, I think, will be a win for us. Uh, we, are a 12, we have a 12-1 lead against them in an all-time series, so... I think that could be a solid game for us, but then I think Ohio is going to take us over because all-time series against the Buckeyes, we are 16-7, to and I just think um, with their play this year, they're going to unfortunately um, get us in that. Hopefully we can take it to five, but I think it just might be a three sweep. It'll be a little bit tough to see if the Cardinals can maybe build off a little momentum, maybe pick mm -hmm. up those first one, maybe two. The Ohio is going to be tough. We'll see how they do. But now the Cardinals have, once again, those two games tomorrow is going to be scheduled for 10 a.m. and 8 p.m., and the Saturday game will start at 6 p.m. Again, all of those will be played in Worthen Arena. Now it's time for another break. When we come back, we'll talk about the Ball State soccer team, which will also see action tomorrow night. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Cardinal Sports Live. Now it's time to talk about some soccer. The team has started off the season pretty well so far with a 4-2-1 overall record. Last year we saw this team pick up a few losses in the beginning of the season and then they kind of turn things around once conference play hit. They picked up a lot more wins, an eight-game winning streak at one point through there. So looking at this team we have this year, compared to last year, how does this team stack up to what we had last year? Um, I think we're kind of right in the same um, position as we were last year at this time. So by game seven last year, we had eight goals, and we were 3-2-2. Two, and two. And so this year we have 11 goals at this point, and we're 4-2-1. and one. So we're in a little bit better position than last year. Um, but I think we have one more game before conference, and I hope that those girls are hungry for getting back into conference play because last year we were beat out by Acre or Akron, and we were number one, and so that should not have happened. That was an upset, and so I hope that they just really want to get back out there and look for that MAC um, championship because I think with that and that hunger and that thirst in them, they will go out there and they'll just kill it. Oh, yeah, we're definitely on a similar pace like Emma was sh saying. Uh, we're undefeated at home still. Uh, we were last year. We we're 6-0-1. Right now we're 3-0-1. Uh, so, again, I look for that to just to continue. Uh, we got a home field advantage. I don't know if you guys ever go out to the soccer games, but the boys club soccer team, they always like to get a little rowdy over there, and the <laughs> girls love it. So uh, it makes for a good environment there. Uh, but, again, when you look at uh, the balancing with Craig Roberts that he does with the two goalkeepers, uh, he has Tristan Studeville, a junior transfer from St. Louis, and then Alyssa Heinschild coming back uh, as a junior. Uh, they're both... They both played in uh, two games, or rather, uh, they, they split the games evenly. 
Uh, Studeville has a better save percentage, but then Craig uh, Roberts is more uh, leans more towards Alyssa Heinschel goal as she is uh, the returning uh, upperclassman with the Cardinals. Uh, so again, I think, like Emma was saying, just similar people uh, doing similar roles as to last year. But again, uh, as with we lost uh, the freshman sensation in Chelsea Swackhammer. She ended up transferring to another uh, D1 school. That's a whole other story in itself. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's just the these other people stepping up in their roles. Well, last week, Ball State played a tough game against ACC opponent Louisville. Alyssa Heinschel was named the MAC Defensive Player of the Week for her performance in that game. Louisville was averaging over three goals per game coming in, but Heinschel racked up a career-high 11 saves and held the whole team scoreless. Ball State ended up pulling out the 1-0 win in double overtime, and this was Ball State's first win against a Power 5 conference team since 2006. So what does this kind of a win against this high caliber of a team mean to this team? Oh yeah, as you alluded to, it's just a big ACC foe in uh, Louisville. It's just definitely a confidence boost for this team. Uh, Ball State was outshot 23-4, to four, so uh, Alicia Heinschel, she uh, definitely had her hands full in the goal, and there was a reason why she was the Mac West Player of the Week uh, on the defensive end. Uh, she was phenomenal in the goal, and also how they were able to convert uh, on only four shots. Uh, that just speaks to volumes of how, I guess, selective this team is, but then also how uh, they're not necessarily able to get all these shots up, and Louisville was a formidable opponent, and it did take uh, an extra period for them to settle this. Um, so again, it was just... It was just a great effort by the Cardinals, and Alyssa Heinschel really came through for the uh, Cardinals in goal. Yeah, I think this <coughs> that this win just speaks um, that we're just we're gonna have a solid run going going into the next game, and that um, it's important that the Cardinals score fast and that they get out there and they're scoring right away because they did take it to the second overtime, like you mentioned, which we don't want to drag it out that long. And so um, I also just like you said, Alyssa Heinschel, she is just fabulous. We could have an entire show about her. I remember talking about her from freshman year into her sophomore year. Her freshman year, she started the last eight games and she just was a powerhouse. And so I think that her, um, her just endurance and her stamina are phenomenal. And I think she's just a key player on this team. And I look forward to seeing her the rest of the season. Talking about the rest of the season, Ball State has one more game here to be played before they begin the conference schedule. That game will be played back at home tomorrow against Moorhead State. The Cardinals faced Moorhead State right about this same time last year, winning that game Three to one. That was also the game that started a huge eight-game win streak for the Cardinals. So, what is the focus of this team going into this game tomorrow to make sure they're on track for for conference play next week? Well, I think Alyssa has the goal covered, so I don't think we have to worry about that. Um, but I think we're going to have to watch out for um, their scorer, Ashley Ritchie. So she's one of their top scorers on the team. And last year against Moorhead, they scored. We only scored three times in the last 20 minutes of play. And so if you wait that long, that's just building up you know, stress throughout the game. So I think that the Cardinals, again, need to get out there, score quickly, and they'll just have so much more just ease when they're playing. And I think if you wait till the last 20 minutes, you're gonna be stressed and you're gonna make errors. So I think that that's what we need to focus on, um, just coming out strong, maintaining throughout the game. And um, I think that this will just be a great game to win going into conference play. And again, we'll have that thirst for that, getting that MAC championship. Oh yeah, I definitely think it'll be a closer game. Ball State's only shooting uh, near 9% uh, on the year uh, with their shots on goal. Uh, so again, it's not really boding well for them on the offensive end compared to years past. Uh, you'll hit Moorhead State. Uh, only 37% of their shots are on goal. Uh, so again, it's just not so. It's just about Alyssa Heinschel, like uh, Emma was saying, staying in goal and coming through like she's been that powerhouse, uh, being a form formidable uh, defensive, uh, you know, stopper in the goal. And also, Moorhead State's only averaging one goal a game. So again, if, I wouldn't be surprised if we see this game uh, go to multiple overtimes uh, later on uh, when this game comes up on Friday. But again, I think definitely uh, this bodes well for Ball State. Now, once again, that women's soccer team will be back home tomorrow night facing Moorhead State, and that game will start at 5 p.m. Now, after the break, we've got a little bit of time left here for one more segment. It'll be game time. We'll talk about who to look out for on each of these Ball State teams. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Cardinal Sports Live. Now, it's still relatively early in the Ball State sports schedule, but we've seen a good amount of action from all three of these teams that we've talked about today. Now, we all know there is no I in team, but every team has a leader. So for tonight's game, I'm going to give you guys a sport, and I'll have you tell me who you think is or will be the standout player for that team. So first, we'll start out with you, Tim. Who is your standout player on Coach News football team? Definitely going to go with Kevon Mabon. Uh, he's got a little bit of 2,000 receiving yards for his career. He just needs around 1,000 more. 
uh, to be Ball State's all-time leading receiver. Uh, you look at their schedule, they got Eastern Kentucky, like we mentioned, coming up, FAU, NIU, and then, you know, the rest of the MAC conference at that. So I think definitely with Mike New's high-powered offense, uh, they're running uh, definitely a lot of plays per game. Uh, it hasn't always been the best as defenses have been able to stop them, and we've seen uh, Kyle Schmidt punting a lot more than I'm sure we'd like to as Cardinal fans, and of course, uh, the turnovers have plagued us as well. But definitely I think Kevon Mabon, uh, he'll step up and be that guy. Because I think you saw with Jordan Williams last year, Kevon was sort of second fiddle to him, and he saw Jordan had a big game against uh, Northwestern. He had his moments throughout the rest of the year, but the big one that stood out was Northwestern, and then he sort of just disappeared. And then definitely his draft, st draft stock plummeted as well. And I'm saying Kevon's going to come out and be uh, Willie Sneed, who's you know set the standard for all uh, Ball State receivers going forward. But definitely I think uh, he can eclipse uh, the 3,000 yard mark for his career and be the uh, leading receiver all time for Ball State. I think more of an up and coming leader will be Malik Dunner. So I think in IU he kind of proved that he's going to be an essential asset to this team um, in the coming season. So he had his first collegiate carries running for 30, uh, 39 yards off of seven carries. So those aren't super high numbers like you have from other players. But I think that he is just he just looks like a promising promising individual and I think that he's going to show it on the field and off the field as a leader as well there. For me, my pick, I chose Darian Green. You know, in week one against Georgia State, he had a huge game on the ground. He's got 214 yards so far. And the passing game for Ball State hasn't been working too well. It's been the running game that's kind of been carrying the offense along with the defense that we talked about earlier. But Darian Green would be my pick. But now for the next sport, we're going to choose a player that is going to stand out on this women's volleyball team. Emma, what do you think? Um, I would have to go with redshirt junior Sabrina Mangafora. You know, last year she was out for an injury, but before that, um, she was very dominant on the court. She was making 289 kills for the season, um, and I'm just excited to see what she's doing. She's already shown this season that even the time she plays, she just, you know, takes every moment, every play, and does something great with it. Um, so she had against, um, she had 22 kills the other night against Appalachian State, and so she's just out there and she's making an effort and she's coming back off of that injury, which you don't often see someone coming that um, strong off of an injury and being a powerhouse right away. So I'm really excited to see her back on the court and see her as a leader again. Oh, yeah, definitely coming into the season, Sabrina was definitely someone you expected to take that next stop uh, from her sophomore year two years ago, you know, make uh, that big jump as one of the go-to hitters from the outside. But I'm going to go with the other outside hitter in Mackenzie Kitchell. I sort of alluded to her earlier. Uh, she was she was granted a fifth year of eligibility. Uh, she's only hitting a, a near 14% on the outside. I definitely think she uh, can improve that going forward. Uh, she's also only fourth on the team in 80 kills. I think definitely, though, that senior leadership, it shows when conference play comes up, you know, when they play NIU, when they play Toledo, all those other teams that have sort of given Ball State trouble in the past. I think definitely that's when uh, McKenzie will start finding a groove there on the outside. You read my mind on that one. Mackenzie <laughs> Kitcher was my pick. You got players like Mangapora, Avila playing very well this year. But Mackenzie Kitcher, especially when we get into conference play, it's been a tough season so far. I think her leadership will really be able to carry this team to where they need to be to pick up more wins throughout the conference. One more sport. We got the soccer team. Who's it going to be? Uh, for soccer, definitely I'm going with Gabby Veldman, another uh, girl who really has performed as well for her respective team. She's the senior. You look at her freshman, sophomore, and junior years uh, combined together. Uh, she's always come out strong. She's always been one of the top three goal scorers on the team, if not uh, top three in getting points with getting assists, uh, setting up her teammates. Um, she's only got two points on the year and two assists. Uh, she's a senior midfield, uh, definitely one of the leaders out there. She's vocal. She's always all over the field. Uh, one of the players that Craig Roberts do, uh, goes to whenever he needs someone to really uh, start momentum and start really spark a fire for the team, respectively. And I know it really hasn't really shown up in the stat sheet, but I know uh, Gary Veldman will start getting her touches eventually, and uh, you know we'll see more assists from her and get that first goal that I'm sure she's been uh, waiting for ever since the season started. So I want to talk more about Alyssa Heinstall, but I feel like we've covered her enough tonight, and she does she deserves all of, you know the recognition. But I'd have to say that one of the other key players is senior Lorena White. So she's another senior, um, like I said, and she had the scoring goal. Um, which was crucial against Louisville. And so without her, we probably wouldn't have won that game. And I think it's just important to really recognize those players who come out, have strong plays, and really make a difference for the team. And so even though she doesn't get as much talk um, as some of the other players, I think she is a leader out there on the field. As you said, Heinz, she got a lot of recognition earlier in our segment. <laughs> but that would be my pick just because the way she's already played this year. In four games, she has 23 saves. That huge game against Louisville was, like, huge to this team. 
really give him a lot of momentum going through the rest of the season, I think. That is my pick. Now we're almost done here. We got one more question. We got a lot of games being played at home for family weekend, football, volleyball, soccer. What is your pick? What, would, what game would you pick to go to if you could only pick one this weekend? I think definitely it's got to be the uh, football team. Uh, that game's going to be pretty great. I think against Eastern Kentucky, it'll be a blowout game. you got two uh, mid-majors going at it. And definitely if you look at the crowd last year from the freshman class, uh, it was definitely a great environment for the VMI game. The crowd sort of dwindled as the year got on. But uh, definitely I think this freshman class is even bigger than the one last year, so I think it'll be a great environment and definitely something I think that'll be worth to uh, see on TV. I can't deny what Tim's saying. You have to go to the football game. If you're here for family weekend, that's what you do. You just go support them. Um, and I think that will be the best game to go to. See you win. Well, that is all the time we have for this episode of Cardinal Sports Live. Be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you for joining us. And remember, we are Ball State Sports.